Good morning. Welcome to our service here at First United Methodist Church. We are so glad that you are joining us this morning. Just a couple of announcements as we've been announcing for the past couple of weeks. We have rescheduled Vacation Bible School. That will be July 27th through the 31st. UMW really does want to thank all of you that participated in their peanut butter and jelly drive. And please, as we move through this very strange situation, continue to remember places like Mission Carthage, Mission Carthage and take your donations by there for them. I know that they are still operating in, in the best way that they can and the safest way that they can to help the people of our community. Seniors and senior families, I know everyone's wondering about the senior dinner. We will make some sort of decision and announcement about that this week. So be listening for that, and also Kevin will be putting out information as the weeks go by about services and, and what will be happening when. So we're again so glad that you're here with us. Now let's worship together. Bye. 
my deepest distress when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply no flame shall not hurt thee my only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine the soul that on Jesus hath lain for repose I will not I will not desert to expose that soul all hell should endeavor to shake I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of God's praise be heard, who has kept us among the living, and has not let our feet slip. For, For you, O God, God have, have tested, tested us. us. You, you have, have tried us as silver is tried. tried. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our loins. Come and hear all you who worship God, and I will tell you what God has done for me. Blessed, Blessed be God, God who, who has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Amen. Falls the eventide, the darkness deepens. Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, O oh, abide. grow dim its glories pass away change and decay in all around I see O oh, thou who changest not abide with me I need thy prayer every passing hour what but thy grace can for the tempter's power who like thyself my guide and stay can be through cloud and sunshine Lord Abide with me. I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Hills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death's sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and Point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks, and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death. 
death, O Lord, abide with me. Good morning. I want to share with you a few uh, updates to your uh, prayer concerns that you received by mail. Uh, or may have seen upon the uh, prayer chain. Uh, first of all, we want to congratulate uh, Alex and Webby uh, on the new birth of their baby girl, uh, Malaya, who was born uh, 6.8 pounds and 18 inches. So we're excited uh, for them. Uh, we also ask uh, a blessing for uh, uh, Christian Jimenez, uh, uh, who's at home uh, with health concerns. Uh, we also ask uh, for blessings uh, and condolences for Pat Yarbrough, uh, who lost her sister, Carolyn Moore, uh, this past week. Uh, and we want to continue uh, to offer uh, blessings and condolences to the family of David Pass and to the family of Lucky Watkins, who passed away this past week. Let us now go to the Lord uh, in prayer, first silently, privately, and I'll lead us together. Oh, Lord, we gather as your people. We're separated by physical space, but we are united by one spirit in one Lord through one faith because of you. And so we gather as your people this morning with our hearts, our hearts open to you, to what you might say to us and where you might lead us this week. Lord, in the midst of a, a new normal as we continue to deal with the challenges of a COVID-19 pandemic. Lord, we know that you are still active amongst us. That you have been uh, teaching us new ways of how to connect and care for one another. That you have been leading those in the fight uh, against this disease. That you have brought healing to so many thousands of folks uh, through the midst of this. But Lord, our faith is unwavering. We know you have this, and we continue to trust in you. Guide us uh, in our thoughts and in our discussions, in our conversations, that as we go out into the world that we might be your light to a world that is in fear or a world that does have anxiety or a world um, that is angry about how these different repercussions from the disease are affecting us. Lord, help us to be your light. Remind us of your way. You didn't promise us an easy life, but you promised us a life where you would always be with us. Help us, Lord, to share your light and your love with others. We ask your blessing, uh, first of all, upon our uh, government leaders, from the local to the federal level, and indeed around the world, that they would be making decisions based upon the wisdom of your spirit. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the researchers and uh, other medical professionals who are both trying to decipher and find a cure and a vaccine and a treatment uh, for this illness, but also those who are on the front lines caring for folks with the illness, as well as caring for all the other things that people still need help with. Lord, give them a double portion of your spirit as we continue in this fight. Lord, we ask your blessing for our school personnel at the college and at the public school and even the preschool level, that each of them would be guided by you that they would find new ways to reach their students and care for them. Lord, we ask your blessing for our students who have found their lives suddenly interrupted. Lord, help them to have faith in the adults who are taking care of them, especially their parents, especially their school teachers and leaders. Help us, Lord, all to trust in you that you have this. And Lord, finally, we ask your blessing for these concerns that we've listed already. 
both for Christian Jimenez, for Pat Yarbrough and the loss of her sister, Carolyn Moore, to the families of David Pass and Lucky Watkins, who've lost their loved ones there. Lord, we ask your continued blessing for Sandy Griffin as she recovers, for Catherine Rose and Georgia Underwood and Carl Hedges. We ask your continued blessing for Madeline Nickel, for Gracie Gregg, for Steve Ambrose, for Steve Swafford, for Larry Ritter. We ask your condolences and your blessings for the family of Sherry Fleming and Kim Smith in the loss of Bob Fleming, who is a friend to so many of us. We ask your blessings continually for Brack Legrone and his family in the loss of his grandmother, Judy Cockrell. And Lord, we give you thanks this week also, for we are reminded of how you continue to bless us over and over. And you have blessed Alex and Webby with a new daughter, Malaya. Lord, that you would just uh, surround them with your love and care as this baby grows up in your image. For we ask all this in the name of Jesus, who's taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us. And Lord, we just ask that you will be with us, that you will continue to bless us, that we will feel and see your blessings. And Lord, we just ask you to remember to share from those blessings with those around us. Lord, help us to find your, your job for us, the thing we were created for, and let us... Uh, have the courage to jump into it. Lord, we pray for our church. We ask that, that we will, you will take our offerings, our gifts, and help our church survive and thrive through this, uh, this darkened time. Help us to be um, also, Lord, praying for the other churches in our community that are going through the same thing. Lord, we pray for them as well, our brothers and sisters throughout this town. Just be with us, Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a song, Kay. I've asked Kay to come, come up with me and sing this uh, beautiful song. I, I found it. I'm, I've known the song, but I re-found it um, as I was surfing through YouTube and found this wonderful duet. Um, husband and wife singing it on there, too. And uh, it was just beautiful. And so we've been working on it and um, it comes from Psalm 91, and that verse goes, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. 
That's comforting, isn't it? He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And he shall raise you up on eagle's wings. Bear you on the breath of dawn. Make you to shine like the sun. And hold you in the palm of his hand. sun and hold you in the palm of his hand. The snare of the fowler will never capture you, and famine will bring you no fear. Under his wings you'll the sun and hold you in the palm of his hand. You need not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. Though thousands fall around shall not come, and he will raise you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun. given a command to guard you in all of your ways. Upon their hands they will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And he will raise you up on eagle's wings. Bear you
Good mo morning, boys and girls. I am so glad that you're watching with us at home. I sure miss you. I wish you were sitting here with me, and I'm praying for you all the time. And today, Pastor Kevin's sermon is a one-word title, and I thought, well, that's a vocabulary word. Resilience is the title of his sermon, Resilience. So what is resilience? If you look it up, if you Google it, Resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. It's toughness, is what it said. You've probably heard the saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. People that keep pushing through, even when things are hard, are resilient. They overcome. They succeed, even when it's hard, even when they have to try really, really hard. And I know some of you had to be really resilient to get through this school year because it got so weird towards the end. And resilience is something that we are real proud of in America. We are strong people, tough people, we push through. But I'm gonna be honest, sometimes that gets hard. Sometimes we get tired. And it's hard to be resilient, and it's hard to keep pushing through. But here's the good news that we find out in the scripture that Pastor Kevin is gonna read. We don't have to be resilient by ourselves. God doesn't leave us alone. He wants his people to be resilient, but he also knows that sometimes that is just more than we can do by ourselves. Most of the time, it's more than we can do by ourselves. So Holy Spirit came and, and dwells on the earth, and we feel that in our hearts, and with God's help and God living in our hearts, we are able to push through no matter how hard things get. And so I want you guys to remember that because I do know that the past couple of weeks, now going into months, I guess, has been very strange and some of it's been maybe kind of fun but some of it has been hard and we've had to be resilient and so remember that God is with you God's Spirit is with you always and he will help you push through no matter what happens let's pray Lord we thank you so much that we can get resilience in you Lord that you can lead us and guide us and keep us and walk with us through anything in Jesus name we pray amen Our scripture this morning comes from John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. It continues on where we had finished off last week uh, of, of Jesus uh, preparing to leave his disciples, but not leaving them in a lurch. Listen now for God's word. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And whoever has these commands continues to love me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are our rock, and you are our redeemer. Amen. A farmer was out standing in the field one day when he noticed his donkey was missing. And he went looking for the donkey, and after a while, he found an abandoned well, and the donkey had fallen down in there. The animal cried piteously for hours by the time the farmer had found him, but the farmer just could not get him out. The farmer didn't know what to do. Finally, he decided the animal was old, and the well needed to be covered up. They just needed to have a funeral for the donkey. It just wasn't worth retrieving it. And so the farmer invited all of his neighbors to come over and help him. 
and they all grabbed a shovel and began to shovel dirt one at a time into the well. At first, the donkey realized what was happening and cried horribly. But then, to everyone's amazement, the donkey quieted down. A few shovelfuls later, the farmer finally looked inside to the well, and he was astonished at what he saw. With each shovel full of dirt falling on the donkey's back, the donkey would do something amazing. He would shake the dirt off and then take a step up. As the farmer's neighbors continued to shovel the dirt in on top of the donkey, he would shake it off, continue to step up until he was back up level with the ground. The donkey showed resilience. Resilience is defined in the dictionary is the ability to jump back or bounce back after adversity. It's to overcome. And we all know of stories of individuals, maybe in our own lives, of where we've hit difficult circumstances and through grit and determination and just sheer willpower, we've overcome. In the sports uh, world, we call it hitting the wall when you're in the midst of a, of, uh, a marathon or a triathlon or something and you just feel like you can't go on and what you're told to do is mind over matter is to push through until you can get to the other side. And, and so we're used to doing this. And uh, as Leah reminded us in her children's sermon, here in America, we're, we're, we're even used to rugged individualism. I'll just pull myself up by my bootstraps and continue on. But each of us, because we're human, because we're made of flesh and blood with a spirit, with the flesh and blood requiring sustenance and rest and reassurance, we each have our own limits. We each have a different limit, but we have a limit. We know none of us gets out of this world alive, at least physically. We know we have a place in heaven. Jesus already told us that at the beginning of chapter 14. He goes to prepare a place for us. Uh, for in his Father's house are many rooms or many mansions, as the King James Version said. But we know that getting out of this world requires death to the body in order that the eternal life might continue on. And we find ourselves sometimes struggling. We hit an adversity, we hit a wall, and we don't know how to get through it. I've been talking to many of you in, in the church and in the community about the challenges of having businesses closed, about the challenges of finding basic foodstuffs uh, in the grocery stores, about the challenges of even having a job or worrying about your 401k or, or worrying about uh, what's going to happen to your kids coming in the fall. Each of us has been hitting different limits in the midst of this pandemic and, and in the midst of our reactions, both officially and unofficially, to the pandemic. It's not been easy. I've been frustrated from the original misinformation from China in the WHO at the beginning to the slow rollout of testing from the CDC to the patchwork of quarantines and shelter in places and safer at home edicts at state and local levels across the United States and indeed, I'm told, around the world. It seems like there could have been a, a more organized approach that wouldn't have kept us apart for nine weeks now from our offices, from our churches, from our schools, from most social uh, events. But I also know even that now we can look back over five months and say, hey, here's where a decision could have been made that, that wasn't made. It's that old 2020 vision. It's always good looking backwards. It's harder looking forwards. And since we haven't had a pandemic like this of any magnitude since a hundred years ago, nobody was quite ready for it. 
I certainly think, though, that after these five months, and certainly over the, the months to come and the weeks to come, uh, we're going to learn more and more. And then over the years to come, historians are going to look back and they are going to scrutinize this era, find out where wonderful decisions were made, where other decisions could have been made. And when the ep next epidemic or pandemic comes around, I think we will be more prepared. Both governments, nations, society, and individuals. We can always learn from our experiences, but right now we're in the midst of it. But even in the midst of this, even in the midst of the challenges we've gone through, through the missteps as well as the triumphs and the successes, some good stuff has happened. I mean, when you think about the rapidity by which the virus was both identified and its genetic code sequenced, if you think about the over 100, 100 teams around the world that are working on vaccines and the countless more number of teams that are working on treatments uh, to help people who already have it, Never before in all of history have so many people with so many resources in so many countries collaborated in so many ways to defeat a common adversary. And we have to give God thanks for this because he's carried us thus far. From whom else do we get our curiosity to study nature itself? And the need to have compassion and love for others, it all came from God. From whom else do researchers and doctors and leaders get their wisdom and skill to do good and to do, but from God? We believe that God provides each of us with those gifts. Specialized gifts, each of us is different, but nonetheless, with the ability to enjoy creation, observe it, and also to co-create, to work with God. We believe God is still at work in his creation. He's created it. He said it was good. When he created us, he said it was very good. But we also know that we live in a fallen world. A fallen world because the first humans chose a desire for the knowledge of good and evil over obedience to God. To mix metaphors just a little bit, it opened a Pandora's box of other issues. As Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden into the world, and we found that childbirth would be painful for women, and that creation would not always work together with the humans, most notably noted by the adder striking the heel of the man even as the man tries to kill it by the head. We therefore know that the triumph and the wonder of good, but we also know the hurt and despair of evil. Paul reminds us of this that our struggle is not just against flesh and blood. He says, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, he says, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Paul realized that we aren't just working against flesh and blood, but against sin that's in the world and against evil that is still in our midst. An old Cherokee was teaching his grandchildren about life, and I, I had heard this story many years ago, but I found it on the University of Texas at Austin Kinesiology Department website. And it continues, this Cherokee was teaching his grandchildren about life. He said, a battle is raging inside me. It's a terrible fight between two wolves. 
One wolf represents fear, anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The grandfather continued on. He says, the other stands for joy, peace, love, hope sharing, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, friendship, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandfather looked at his children with a firm stare. He says, this same fight goes on inside of each of you and inside each of us as well. The grandchildren thought for a moment, and they finally dared to ask their grandfather, which wolf wins? And the grandfather replied, the one that you feed. The one that you feed. Because we know that sin abounds, but the Apostle Paul reminds us that grace abounds more. He says it this way in Romans chapter 5, verse 18 through 21. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. That is, both the sin of Adam and Eve resulted in condemnation for all of us, but the one righteous act of Jesus Christ resulted in justification for all of us. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many would be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. You see, if we think about it just as my sin and your grace or my grace and your sin, it's always going to be fighting. And that wolf inside of us will always be having a challenge if I'm doing it on my own. Because as soon as I want to be gentle, as soon as I want to be friendly, as soon as I want to be kind and caring and thoughtful of the least amongst us, then on the other side, the other wolf comes out and says, what about you? That is, what about me? What about my needs and my wants, my desires? my way of looking at things. We would be in a hopeless situation if each of us was left to our own devices with our own wolves fighting there between doing good and doing evil, between uh, loving our neighbor and just loving ourselves. But what we know is Jesus has come to give us new life. And Jesus sends us the Holy Spirit. And so we have this grace that has given us the opportunity for new life. And Jesus sends this Holy Spirit that continues to work in us, that nudges over, that overwhelms that part of us that doesn't always look out for the least of us. Jesus works in each of us by his grace to help change us so that we look at the world as Jesus does. But Jesus told his disciples, he says, I must go, I must return to the Father, but where I go, you will not be able to come. And, and they said, what are we going to do? He says, I will send you another advocate. I'd never really noticed that before because I'd always thought about the advocate, the paraclete, the, the comforter of the Holy Spirit as being the advocate. But what it says there is, I will send you another advocate to be with you forever. Which says two things to me. First of all, it says Jesus is looking out for us. Even as he returns to the Father, he says, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who will bring you power from on high that we will find out later as we read the scriptures of Pentecost. But it also says this. It says, 
by sending another advocate, Jesus is reminding us that he is the first advocate. The one who went to the cross for each of us, who now returns back to the Father, having claimed us as his own. We have become his sheep. He is our shepherd. And when we fail, when our sins overwhelm us, when, when evil comes in, we find that Jesus' grace abounds all the more. He says, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Jesus is reminding us that as he sends the Holy Spirit to us, is that we're not just going to have a, a life of, of fear and despair and uncertainty. And those disciples had been through all of that. They had both been in the midst of his earthly ministry as Jesus had found himself uh, again and again at odds with religious authorities and other uh, community leaders. And they would find themselves uh, a little afraid of what's going to happen. They also found themselves afraid when they would be out in the boat and the, the storms or other natural phenomenon would occur and they wouldn't be sure of what to do. And Jesus would always remind them, I've got this. Saying to the storm, peace, be still. But then Jesus talked about stopping his earthly ministry. That is, about giving up his life, about allowing himself to be punished, arrested, and killed. And Peter was the first to step up and say, no, Lord, I will never let this happen. And Jesus says, you want the things of men. Step behind me, Satan. For Jesus is reminding us that he's come here on a mission from the Father to reconcile, reunite, to re-relate the world to God. The disciples are certainly fearful, both in hearing that Jesus is going to do this and certainly that night when Jesus goes to do this and he's arrested and, and Judas has sold him out and one by one they leave him and then by that Sunday morning they're all fearful within a room until they hear the words that Jesus' body is gone, that he is no longer here but is risen from the women who go to the tomb and yet they have to wait 50 more days. 50 more days. What does it mean that Jesus is gone, but everything's going to be okay? What does it mean that Jesus has died, but he is now risen? What does that mean? They were undoubtedly fearful. Jesus was reminding them, and if I go, I will send another advocate who will be with you. This advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. We clasp hold of that. We grab hold of it because we want to know that things are going to be okay. The Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, what then shall we say in response to all these things? He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him, graciously give us all things. So you got Jesus, who's advocated for us. you got the Holy Spirit he has now sent as the new advocate to work in us. And you have God the Father who's been working all along, who's been for us. If God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can be for us, who can be against us? 
Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And so what we find here in the midst of this advocacy and of this interceding is it's going both ways. It's both interceding for us, uh, the Holy Spirit, as Paul reminds us uh, later on with the Spirit, intercedes for us and groans too deep for words. It's letting God the Father, the, the, the Trinity, to know uh, what's going on in our hearts that even we are unsure of. Our anxiety, our fear, our frustrations, our anger, our uncertainty. This Spirit is already interceding for us. But the Spirit also intercedes in this way, as Jesus had been. The Spirit also teaches us, as Jesus had also taught us, to trust in God. And it enables us to trust deeper. Let God's Spirit move in you to help you put your trust deeper into God, even in the midst of all that's going on. Lauren Daigle wrote a, a, a song entitled Rescue, and she says, You were not hidden. There's never been a moment. You were forgotten. You were not hopeless. Though you have been broken, your innocence stolen, I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS. Your SOS. And she's singing this song from the perspective of God. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. To find you, I will rescue you. There's no distance that cannot be covered. Over and over, you're not defenseless. I'll be your shelter. I'll be your armor. I hear your whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS. Your SOS. About 500 years ago, less than 200 years after the Black Death Plague had ravaged Europe, it reemerged. This bubonic plague had reemerged in Germany, in Wittenberg, where Martin Luther was already beginning to reform the church. And it happened in other cities in Germany as well. And Martin Luther was pondering what's going on because some people were fleeing the towns who had the ability to do so. And he saw some public servants and ministers flee in the towns because they had the ability to do so. And he weighed in and he said that the responsibility of ordinary citizens, that the responsibility particularly of public servants, is to care for others even as if they are Christ himself. Matthew reminds us that when we care for the least of these, the sick, the lame, the imprisoned, the hungry, the naked. When we do it for any of these, we're doing it for Christ himself. And so Martin Luther was reminding us, reminding his people 500 years ago, reminds us again today, that we each still have this duty to one another, to look out for each other as if that other person were Christ himself. Matthew, of course, later on, uh, and Luke as well, record this as Jesus saying, it's the second greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself, that we think about others in the midst of this crisis. And so, yes, even as many things shut down, people are still hungry, people are still homeless, people are still in need of medical care, uh, which is why I'm so glad Leah had mentioned Mission Carthage, which is why I'm so glad we continue to do uh, the peanut butter and jelly drive for Mission Carthage. But it's also why we continue to do book blessings to help provide some type of educational enjoyment for the kids this summer a little bit early. But if Martin Luther said that we're really need to be caring for others he also said but remember also to take care of yourself that it's a balance Jesus says love your neighbor as yourself don't love your neighbor more than yourself because then you have 
put yourself uh, less than who God created you to be, but don't love yourself more than your neighbor. That is to think that you're superior or somehow more worthy than others. And so Jesus both reminds us, love your neighbor as you love yourself, because we're each created in God's image. And Martin Luther says, you've also, in the midst of the pandemic that was ravaging uh, Wittenberg and, and Germany in general back then, he says, you got to honor yourself and take care of yourself. He even went back and, and looked at Ephesians. He says, after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. Or he looks back in 1 Corinthians, he says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with a special honor. That is, if we use the body to talk about the very sacred nature of the church and the relationship between Christ and the church, then this same body which God has created and given us life in and breathed life into, we're also supposed to treat with sacredness and care. It's why we don't go and stand in front of a, a train. We know God could stop the train, but we don't go and test God to do so. It's why I remind my boys regularly, we don't go and roll in poison ivy. Because we can trust that God can kill the poison ivy. We can trust that God can uh, take away the itching. But Jesus reminds us that we don't test God. And so in the midst of our individual as well as collective efforts to battle this epidemic, we're reminded that we don't test God in the midst of this by, by doing knowingly foolish things, but we always strive to, to use uh, wisdom and best practices to figure out what is possible in the midst of this epidemic. What's possible for me, what's necessary for me in terms of going out to get groceries for my family, what's necessary for us as we come together for limited engagements, whether it becomes graduation uh, in a couple of weeks or, or church services hopefully soon or, or funerals or weddings or visiting people in the hospitals. What is possible? We try to think of what all is the best ways to care for one another while also caring for ourselves. We're reminded that we live in a world of flesh and blood, but we don't live just against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the rulers of this dark world, a spiritual world that continues to work around us. And this virus seems to be part of that. At some point, it probably had a good point, uh, had a good use in the world, but now it's become a problem for humanity being used against us. And as a result, all of our machinations and, and ways of changing up our lives in order to try to avoid the virus has also caused more challenges. Sin abounds for sure, but grace abounds more. The good news for us is that Jesus has sent an advocate, one who lives in and amongst us, who has pulled us together, that holds for us and intercedes for us, gathers us, and then sends us out in mission and in purpose. We're called to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're called to care for one another and to think what is the best way to care for each other as well as what is the best way to care for ourselves. Because in the end, if we just use our own personal strength and resolve and fortitude, we will find ourselves falling. But if we trust that God can get us through this and that God will continue to raise up leaders to show us how to get through this, we will find ourselves bouncing back even sooner. I don't want to sugarcoat and say things are all okay now 
or that things will all be okay tomorrow. But what I do know is that God will be with us in the midst of it. Jesus says he sent another advocate. Jesus is advocating for us even now. The Holy Spirit is even advocating for us even now. God the Father is advocating for us even now. As we continue to be God's people in the world, as we continue to be a light into the world, caring for ourselves and loving others as much as ourselves, we will find ourselves okay. I remind you, we are in the midst of a challenge, but we can have resilience through our Lord and our Savior, through the Holy Spirit, and through the Father who loves us all. Dwayne and Kay had sung on the wings of eagles earlier on, and I wanted to end by quoting again Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not be faint. Jesus has sent another advocate which shows God's love for us through and through. Go forth and be a light out into the world knowing that God's got this. Amen. Go forth in the love of God, in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and through the power and communion of the Holy Spirit who dwells in all of us. Amen.
Thank you.